somebody around you this morning. Okay, you ready to go? I am too. So let's take the lights down. Take a deep breath in. And just went down the exhale. Ah. There is so much happening outside of these walls. And I would venture to say that there's a lot happening inside your head. Combine the two, it can look like pure chaos. But right now in this moment, what I want us to do is I want us to know that what is going outside is outside right now and what is in your head needs to stop. Stop spinning long enough for us to get centered, get quiet, get into that space where we can begin to create healing and evolving and loving and more joyful and loving experiences in our life. Let's take another deep breath in and exhale out. Get ready, my soul. I'm diving in. Get ready, my soul. I'm diving in to the deepest kind of love to the sweetest kind of life get ready get ready my soul every Everything I've ever seen Everything I've lost or won And everything I've ever dreamed Has brought me here To this present moment here To a new beginning here and I'm seeing life so clearly now please join me get ready my soul I'm diving in I'm diving in to the deepest kind of love, to the sweetest kind of life. Get ready, get ready, my soul. Get ready, get ready, my So I take this time to go deeper within 
And I ask and invite you to go with me, feeling and knowing that expression of divine love, knowing that the oneness of God, that one life, one heart, one love is my essential being. And I take that in as my true and essential self. And as I experience this for myself, I know this for each and every person gathered here, each and every person hearing the sound of my voice wherever you are in the world, and recognize that there is only love that guides us. That the things going on in the world today, the things that don't feel so good for some of us, we know that we can change this and experience this as living in the light. That shadow side that comes up for us that feels dissonant and unconscionable and, and not where we want to be. I can guide and direct that with my thoughts to that place of living in the light. That uplifting sense of consciousness, it takes practice. It takes a daily devotion to knowing that I live in that place of divine love, divine expression, and in that place of the heart-centered life. I know that I'm able to experience life to its fullest, no matter what is going on. If I live in that place, I need not fear that shadow part of me, the shadow part of life, the shadow part that's occurring sometimes daily around me. But I can live in that place of divine love, divine absolute expression of the light. So I know this deeply inside for myself. I know that as I direct my thoughts and actions into that place of pure love, that my life feels content, that I have a place of peace. And if I am not there, I can always return there at any moment, any moment, knowing that I am safe in this sacred high place of God. And this is a place of gratitude. So we have gratitude for all that help this service, who support this service, volunteers, paid or otherwise. We support our ushers and our greeters, the men and women who support us in our live stream and in our sound boards and all the beautiful members of our band and backup singers and everything that happens in the back office, those people there who care and love this place dearly, for it is part and an essential part of their life. For our ministers and practitioners who are available to each and every person here 24-7, 365 days of the year, we are here for you to support you, to love you, to heal you. And for our beloved Dr. Joe, in whom is the vessel today and whom spirit speaks in and through, we know that that message guides and directs us into places that are full and expressing that beautiful experience of God. So for this and so much more, for the gratitude and love that we are here together in community, that we know that there is love here, that there is a place of safety, I release my word knowing that it is already so. And if you're in agreement with me, please join by saying, and so it is. Loving spirit dwells in me. This is my serenity. As within, all around, all I need is here and Where there's air, let me love, and I have no fear. All the power, all the glory, I surrender, let it Loving spirit 
Send my love over the mountains. I send my love over the sea. I send my love into the heavens. And it returns to me. Sending out joy. I send my joy. I send my joy over the sea. I send my joy into the heavens. And it returns to me. Setting out peace. I send my peace over the mountains. I send my peace. So uh, we have been talking about the first four chapters of our textbook over the past month. And this is this fourth Sunday, so we're going to wrap up the fourth chapter. So William, pop the slides up for me, please. Our yearly theme is the values-based spiritual living. Our monthly theme is that we learn and practice our philosophy, the science of mind. We live principle-centered, spirit-led lives and turn to our principles for guidance in all moments and in all areas of our lives. What we've done the past few weeks is this. We've talked about the thing itself, the way it works, what it does. That's what we've done the past three weeks. This week, we're going to talk about how to use it. Now, for those of you here for the very first time, you look at the word thing and the word it, and you're like, "Uh uh-oh. What are they talking about? What is this? This is kind of strange. So what Dr. Holmes and our philosophy does is he strips it down to the most simplest of terms without putting any labels on it. Because as soon as we put a label on it, think about if I put spirit on it or God on it or Jesus or Allah or Muhammad or whatever label you put on it, everybody has some sort of perspective, has some sort of commentary or opinion about putting a label on something and what it means to them. So Dr. Holmes, in his simplest forms, just calls it the thing itself, you know, what it does or what it, you know, the way it works, what it does and how to use it. So here's your affirmation for today. Here we go. Today I say yes and allow the creative process to manifest for my highest good. Say it again. Today I say yes and allow the creative process to manifest for my highest good. Dr. Holmes, these are all quotes from the fourth chapter, so these are all things coming directly from the textbook. While it is true and wrong that conditions exist, they could not remain unless there were someone to experience them. So I kind of like that. You know, when, when things are going wrong in my world, when things are going wrong in my world, the only reason they continue to go wrong in my world is because I'm experiencing them as wrong. I'm defining them. Now, they, they may not feel right, but I'm labeling them, and I'm holding on to the label, and we know the way, by the way it works that when I hold on to the idea, the universe continues to create more of the idea, Right? 
So if I was not going to participate in my misery, how could misery be participating in my world? The only way for it to participate is for me to volunteer for this. No, that's, ew, yuck, that's nasty. Who wants to volunteer for it? But we do. So I love when he says this. If, if it's true that wrong conditions, excuse me, while it's true that wrong conditions do exist, there could, they could not remain unless there were someone to experience them. Consequently, the experiences must be in consciousness. So in my world, in my world, I have to, and this is like the lesson for me is, when I am experiencing the discord of something, either inside my world or in, my, in the outside world, I have to decide how my consciousness is going to describe it, how it's going to, and as much as we hate it, it's going to label it, and how I'm going to process and file it, okay? Because how I determine that from the onset is going to determine how miserable or how neutral or how happy I am. Now, change in consciousness, change the condition. We know that. One of the greatest difficulties in the new order of thought is that we are likely to indulge in too much theory and too little practice. Yeah, we, we, we know what we know, and we come here on Sundays, and we have classes every night of the week. We know what we know, but still, when something pops up, what is our immediate response? We go back to old behaviors and reacting in old ways. We're not taking it and actually applying the principle. Sometimes what we do, though, is we go, we catch ourselves, and this is the wise thing to do. You're not going to be perfect. Anyone here perfect? Good. We're in great company, all right? So that means anyone that just looks like me. So as I hear something and it impacts me, I get to decide in that moment how I'm going to react. And sometimes I react appropriately, sometimes not. But here's the, here's the catch for me. The catch for me, and I think the catch for us, is to try to limit the amount of time we stay in the context of the negative label and perception and try as quickly as we can to move it into something else, whether that is a simple call to prayer, whether it is I am going to see the highest and best good unfolding in my life and in the lives of others, no matter what it is, it may seem Pollyanna, but the longer I stay in the condition, the longer I stay in the effect, the longer I drown in what's going on, I am of no help to myself or anyone else. So I have to pull myself out of the pool first. Does that make sense? All right? Together, please. Today I say yes and allow the creative process to manifest for my highest good. He says this, and I love it. It is easy enough to rush about shouting that there are no sick people, but this will never heal those who appear to be sick. We should look at a wrong condition with the knowledge that we can change it. Say that last part with me, please. We should look at a wrong condition with the knowledge that we can change it. You know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say we should look at a wrong condition and go, I have no idea how this is ever going to get done. I have no idea what to do with this. I have no idea what to do. Well, you don't, and maybe you don't. But for you to say that there isn't something that knows how to change wrong conditions is to negate the power and presence of God right here and now. So that's something we have to eliminate from our vocabulary. Why I might not have the answer, and do I, anyone here who's not perfect, right? We know no one's perfect, but does anyone here have all the answers? My husband would differ. He'd say, you know everything. <laughs> you know everything about everything, don't you, right? But be that as, be, be that as the case, not true, <laughs> although I think it is, but not true. <laughs> I still say it's true. Not true. We should look at a wrong condition with the knowledge that we can change it, that we can change it, that there's something that is going to change it, and we are going to be an active participant in it. It may not have revealed itself to us yet, but that's not to say that it doesn't exist because then that would be saying there is a problem that God cannot fix. Are you with me? Are we riding this together? Okay. 
So it's easy to rush about going, there's no problems in the world, there's no sick people, there's no, there's no hunger, there's no starvation, there's no limitation, there's no financial issues, but that's not going to heal anything. But what's really not going to heal anything is the person who believes that that is the end of the conversation, that there isn't something else that can happen and will happen through something much larger than them. Next thing, God does not punish the mathematician who fails to obtain the right answer to the problem. You know that? The thought of the unsolved problem does punish him until he applies the right principle and thus secures the desired result. Many times we sit, God doesn't punish the mathematician for not having the answer, but I tell you what, there are times when I feel like I'm punished because I don't know how to fix something. I know it's wrong and I don't know how to fix it. Anyone feel this way? In your life and in the outside world, anyone feeling like I don't know how to do this? Okay, continue reading on. The thought of the unresolved problem does haunt us. It punishes us until we apply principle to it. The problem that I'm having and the problem that I'm seeing in a lot of places is there's a lot of that chatter going on outside about um, you know, what can we do? What can I do? How can I fix this? And it leads to the point where no one has an answer, but no one has the answer to say, what would happen if we applied spiritual principle to this in this scenario? And actually come up with a conversation that says, this is how we can fix this. We can apply spiritual principles. The whole part of this, the whole part of this whole chapter, this whole chapter is about, or, or this whole, um, the whole month is about understanding how we are in the bigger picture, how you and I reside in the bigger picture, how we are our small self amongst the big self. And that the problem we have is when I look at myself as the small self who's not capable of accessing the big self, then I live in my smallness. But it requires all of us to become bigger here. Are you with me? Are you okay? All right. No volume required. Conditions are not entities. We are entities. And he goes on to say, cannot that which consciousness, excuse me, cannot, cannot that which is consciousness cast out that which has no consciousness? Conditions are not entities. We are entities. Fear is not an entity. Scarcity. Disease, those aren't entities. You're a spiritual entity. Cannot that which has consciousness catch, cast out that which does not? Does fear have a consciousness? Go back to the first slide. If there weren't somebody around to experience fear, would we have fear? Okay, but you, you say, but it's a human reaction. Of course, that's a human reaction. But it's not an entity. So what changes it? We do. Are you with me? If we, proper, if we properly understood, we will be able to remove false conditions as easily as Jesus did. He knew, but our faith is weak. We must strengthen it, and we can. So shrugging our shoulders, I don't know. What the, what do we, what, I don't know. What, what's going on in the world? I don't know. What, what are we supposed to I don't know. That's not the answer. I do know what the answer is, and it's not that I'm going to answer it for everybody, but I'm certainly going to initiate what spiritual tools I have in my spiritual toolbox to bring peace so that I'm not going like this, but rather I'm seeing something rightly. When you're in the middle of the tornado, I bet it doesn't feel really good. I bet when Dorothy was getting tossed around in that house, right? Right? Do you think that felt good? No. No. So, but eventually it lands, and you walk through a process. This is a good analogy. Where did I come up with that? You walk through the process of the yellow brick road. It wasn't an instant answer, was it? And other characters come in and represent certain parts of you that you need to learn about yourself, and they need to learn about themselves. But it seems to me that when we're in the heart of this tornado is not the time to be going, I don't have the answer. We got to let the house land. We got to let the house land and we got to start the process of walking down this road. Does that make sense? But we have to know that it's going to land. So you can't go like this anymore. 
and you can't shrug your shoulders. We have to know. We have to know. If no one else knows, I want everyone else in this room to know that we have to know that greater good is unfolding for all people and that this is a process by which we're getting there. I may not agree with it. It may cause pain and harm in the short term. It may cause sort of chaos and havoc. But oh my God, okay, on the, on the macrocosm, that happens in the macro world, I do it in my life all the time. I cause micro pains all the time. Not just at what's going outside, but what drama I attach to anything. I can get an email and get dramatic. I can get a text message and you go, oh my God. And that's while driving. I mean, come on. It's very easy to fall into those patterns. This is a wake-up for all of us. Our, the, the, I think it's brilliant that we went back to basics in January. I think it's really timely that we went back to the basics for the past four months to reestablish the foundation as we launch into the rest of the year. Priceless. Together, please. Today I say yes and allow the creative process to manifest for my highest good. Limitation has no law to support it. Limitation has no spiritual law to support it. What supports limitation? My consciousness. If I didn't participate in its, in, in its activity of limitation, if I didn't hold up limitation in my mind, would, it, would we experience that? Would I experience it? No. But, we, but we're so used to harboring it. We're so used to having it into our, into our life. We kind of weave a little limitation in. It's a really good excuse not to go to the gym or participate in some conversations or to go on a trip or to do something or to step out of your comfort zone because you, you weave all those limitations into the tapestry of who you are. But there's no spiritual law to support it. There's only me and my consciousness to support it. Matthew says this, should we refuse to look at sickness, poverty, and happiness? We will not refuse to help the helpless or lift up the fallen, but we will refuse to wallow in the mud because of our sympathies. And this is the quote from Matthew. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So it's not that we're refusing to see it. You can't not see something. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you ring the bell, you cannot ring the, unring it. Once you say it, you can't unsay it. Right? So when we see things, we sh should we refuse to look at this? Absolutely not. But we have to look at it without getting in it and falling in the ditch of it. How are your conversations lately with other people? Are they on the high part of the ditch? Are they out of the ditch and kind of like looking down at it? Or are you just jumping in the ditch? question. You have to ask yourself where you sit in that. If the blind lead the blind, we both end up in the ditch. What is our spiritual responsibility? Is it principle-driven, spiritually-led life? To rise, up, to rise above that and stay out of that conversation at that frequency and that vibration. Do you want to jump into that frequency and vibration voluntarily? Boy, I tell you what, though, it's hard not to because emotionally we're very quick to respond, aren't we? Anybody? Just six of us. Okay, good. Well, the rest of you guys, you're doing great. I'll meet you at the bar. Okay. This came, this is a quote written in 1927. When? 1927. Say it again. 1927. Did I write this quote? No. Was I born in 1927? No. Some of you were, but no. No. This is a direct quote, 1927, Dr. Ernest Holmes. The world has never yet followed the simple ethics of Jesus, yet it is loud in its proclamation that it is Christian. I'm not going to touch that one. But it was written in, and it's in the book. I didn't write it, but I certainly think it's worth reading. Don't you think? 
Say it together, please. Today I say yes and allow the creative process to manifest for my highest good. The truth is instantaneous in its demonstration, taking only such time in its unfoldment as is inherent in the law of a logical and sequential evolution. We must trust the invisible, for it is the sole cause of that which is and will become visible. Let's unpack that. Just let's unpack that, all right? The truth is instantaneous. It's just like your body. When you cut your body, what happens? You bleed, but what's happening instantaneously? The white blood cells are running to clot to start the healing process, right? Well, maybe in your life you've got a lot of things that are cut that need healing, but they're in their, but you have to understand that the universe is, acts just like that, those blood cells, unless you're on Coumadin, but that's another whole thing, okay. <laughs> just like those blood cells. The universe acts just like what it does on the micro, it does on the macro. So the universe acts just like that. So the discord going on in your life and the discord going on outside of this building, you have to know that there are blood cells rushing to heal the situation. We may not see it because it's in the invisible, but we have to know it's there because all things that are come from this thing that is invisible. Are you okay? Is it good? Is that working for you? Can you apply it? Can you see how it can apply if you choose to apply it? It follows. <laughs> it follows that if we believe that it will not work, it really works by appearing to not work. When we believe that it cannot and will not, then, according to the principle, it does not. But when it does not, it still does, only it does according to our own belief that it will not. Like that one? Yeah. Don't need to unpack that one. Pretty much says it all. All right? Life is self-imposed. So here we go. The grand finale of the fourth chapter. All right. All right, take a deep breath in. Just listen to this. A new light is coming into the world. We are in the borderland of a new experience, written in the veil between spirit and matter is very thin. The invisible passes into visibility through our faith in it. A new science, a new religion, and a new philosophy are rapidly being developed. This is in line with the evolution of the great presence and nothing can hinder its progress. It is useless as well as foolish to make any attempts to cover this principle or to hold it as the vested right of any religion, sect, or order. The truth will out. The spirit will make itself known. Happy are we if we see these things which, from the foundation of the human race, have been longed for by all aspiring souls. True thought deals directly with first cause, and this science is the study of first cause, spirit, or the truth, that invisible essence, the ultimate stuff and intelligence from which everything comes, the power back of creation, the thing itself. The timing of this chapter, this is the last paragraph of, of that whole section. The timing just seems to scream at me. I don't know about anybody else. But it just really is making me think that something greater is always unfolding. And while we may not see it in process, 
One doesn't like to put their hand in boiling water, but one likes what happens when food goes in and comes out of boiling water. Are we good? Have a good week, everybody. Thank you.